Good morning and welcome to this United States Energy Association monthly briefing, this one on the electric utility industry and how it will meet its targets for 2035 and 2050 in the light of growing demand, both to reduce carbon emissions, but also maybe a doubling by 2020 of the demand for electricity. We have a stellar panel of experts today, and we have excellent journalists who know a great deal about the subject going in. But first, I'd like to ask Sheila Hollis, Acting Executive Director of the US Energy Association, uh, who makes this possible to give us a few words of welcome. Thank you so much, Llewellyn, and welcome to our outstanding panel and the uh, and the brilliant journalists who uh, help us by uh, asking such insightful questions every time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, just a moment about the United States Energy Association, a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-lobbying animal, very rare in Washington indeed. Uh, it, I think it's the, the only one of its species. Uh, and uh, what we do is to uh, try and help the world. We work in uh, we worked in 104 countries throughout the world to bring energy supply, to improve the mm -hmm. delivery of energy, uh, to uh, train, uh, to prevent accidents, to do a variety of things in uh, all these countries. And we're working very actively right now in Eastern Europe, uh, particularly um, including Ukraine. Uh, to to help the people there, basically. Uh, but we're also active in Africa, uh, South America, Central America, and Asia. Uh, and in addition to the role that we play on the international field, uh, our goal is also to educate and inform and interact with the American energy um, community and beyond, uh, and to basically uh, help bring education from the experts uh, right in a very distilled form, working with our dear friend and longtime colleague uh, on so many things, Llewellyn uh, and his team. Uh, so with that, I turn it back to you, Llewellyn, and thank you so much for including me today. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, our panel today of experts is headed by Jigar Shah, Director of the Loan Programs Office at the Department of Energy. He has the money, so we're going to be very interested in what he has to say. Good Rowe, President of Northwestern Energy. Matthew Lind, Director of 1898 and Company, which is part of Burns and McDonald. David Naylor, President of Rayburn Country Electric Cooperative. And Jim Matheson, Chief Executive Officer of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Our panel of knowledgeable journalists, headed by Jennifer Hiller of the Wall Street Journal. Matt Chester, Energy Central, Robert Walton, Utility Drive, Ken Silverstein, Forbes, and Rod Cookrow, Freelance. I've asked Jigar to take a few minutes longer than other people to explain the position and the role of the loan office at DOE and how it's going to handle all the new money appropriated by Congress. Jigar, it's your Thank you very much for this opportunity, Llewellyn. I think, you know, we might want to just start with a quick summary of the Loan Programs Office. It was, you know, established in 2005, had a big heyday from 2009 to 2011, putting about $35 billion worth of loans out the door. Today, the Inflation Reduction Act gave us an additional $100 billion of authority in our established programs. So that's it's Title 1703. That's where we did a lot of the solar and wind and geothermal and transmission projects. Another 40 billion in advanced technology vehicle manufacturing programs, right? That's where Tesla and Ford got their loans. And then uh, in the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program, where we received a <coughs> billion dollars there, um, which paired with the direct pay that tribes get uh, for the tax credits will, I think, be quite a boon for tribes and solar wind development. We also got an interesting new program uh, called the 1706 program which basically is structured as $5 billion of credit subsidy and is uh, designed to help transition existing energy infrastructure, coal plants, natural gas plants, transmission lines, um, tank farms, uh, pipelines, um, refineries, and convert them into something that can continue to provide economic output for their communities for the next uh, you know, 40 plus years. And so um, that 5 billion can stretch 
uh, depending on how risky the loans are, right? So if it's a very risky project, then um, it may only stretch to $25 billion for that $5 billion of credit subsidy. And if it's low risk projects like converting coal to nuclear plants, then it might be uh, able to stretch to $250 billion, which is the statutory limit of the loan programs office um, for that program. I mean, one of the things I would say though, uh, simply is that I think it's critical to recognize the loan programs office doesn't take real technology risk. We take perceived technology risk, which our 10,000 engineers, scientists, and experts on our platform can assure us doesn't exist. So for instance, the monolith materials deal we did is methane pyrolysis, been around for 25 years. People are very nervous about it. But you've also got things like fuel cells or HVDC transmission lines or other things that are fairly established, but still scary to people um, in the commercial banking sector, right? And so that that's really where we play a big role. And in this next generation, clearly coal to nuclear, we've identified 300 sites of existing and recently shut down coal plants that can be converted to nuclear is going to be scary for commercial debt players. But also a lot of the hydrogen projects are still not comfortable for um, the commercial banking market. So we do a lot there. But also when you look at virtual power plants and the essential nature that they played in both the Texas uh, electricity crisis as well as the California crisis this year, uh, you start to see that demand flexibility and those types of projects are now front and center. And again, places where commercial banks have not yet found their footing, right? And so I think in sector after sector, um, there is an assumption that the commercial markets are ready to go. But I think in general, they're really only interested in solar, wind, and some battery storage right now, and figuring out how to help them get their sea legs so they can start to contribute at scale in these other sectors is exactly what we do with the Loan Programs Office. Thank you very much, Rick. I'd <coughs> like to go through the panel, each one saying just a few moment, words about your own operation and where you stand. Robert Rowe of uh, Northwestern Energy. Sure. Thank you. So we are uh, an electric and a natural gas company uh, serving uh, heavily in Montana, uh, uh, partially vertically integrated on the electric side, also have some natural gas production. We serve electric and natural gas in South Dakota, natural gas in Nebraska, and we also serve electric in Yellowstone Park. Uh, we've had a long-term focus on basic infrastructure uh, and uh, you can frame that in terms of capacity, flexibility. I like to think of it as making the system say yes to our customers over time. Our electric portfolio is, uh, depending on uh, dispatch, what we actually deliver is close to, or in some cases over 60% carbon free, thanks to the hydro system, but our traditional resources continue to have uh, extreme importance. Uh, we operate them differently, uh, but in Montana, for example, we are severely exposed to the uh, regional power market, and that is a more and more frightening place to be. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Lind. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you, Llewellyn. Thank you, Sheila, uh, for having me today. I'm really excited to join this distinguished panel um, and, and really have a conversation, talk about the challenges of getting to net zero, 100%, whatever the uh, kind of lofty goals that we're looking uh, at uh, for utilities across the country. Um, so Matt Lind, Matthew Lind, I'm a director within 1898 and Co., which is part of Burns and McDonald. 1898 and Co. is a business technology and security solutions consultancy. We leverage the practical real world design, engineering, construction background that we um, have by virtue of being part of Burns and McDonald to do our consulting. Um, so I, I've been a, a consultant in the electric and utility sector going back to 2004, so nearly two decades. Um, I, I support planning uh, activities, looking at uh, the grid and planning for the future, um, studies that are strategic, economic, regulatory uh, in nature, looking at both generation and transmission development markets across North America, as well as some international work as well. And David, Pleasure to be here. David? Yeah, thank you, Llewellyn. Um, with Rayburn Country Electric Cooperative, we're a, a generation and transmission cooperative, which is essentially a wholesale provider of electricity that's located just outside of Dallas, Texas. We have uh, served 16 counties. Uh, or we have four distribution cooperative members who uh, 
uh, serve the retail and ultimately represent about a quarter of a million uh, folks. And we've got a nice diverse uh, group from uh, suburban areas, with a lot of neighborhoods, uh, fast growing systems. And then we have some more rural areas. And this, uh, this transition is an interesting, interesting walk for us uh, we, uh, as we try to balance the needs of the more rural areas with the, the, the increasingly uh, suburban uh, areas that we serve. Uh, we've already pivoted to a lot more distributed type resources and trying to put uh, those options in uh, our members' hands to give them that flexibility and uh, you know try to work through to make sure that the infrastructure is in place to accommodate as we as we as we walk that walk uh, and listen to our members so thank you thank you uh, jim matheson last but clearly not least well thank you well jim matheson i'm the ceo of the national rural electric cooperative association or the national association for 900 electric cooperatives. David, who just spoke, is one of our members. Uh, rural electric cooperatives serve one in eight Americans, uh, roughly 42 million people. We also cover 80, excuse me, 56% of the land mass of this country. Uh, we're very interested in this discussion. Uh, our foundational view of all policy issues is reliability and affordability, because we are owned by the members we serve. We have no shareholders to fall back on. Uh, it's consumer owned perspective. And so uh, I look forward to this conversation. We think that uh, any transition creates a lot of choices and transitions by definition are not always perfectly planned out. And anticipating challenges in a transition is an important task for all of us to undertake as we maintain reliability and affordability in the electric grid. Thank you. We'll go straight to Q&A. Rod Kukro, would you like to start us off, please? Certainly, uh, thank you, Llewellyn. Um, it's, it's nice to be here again with uh, with your uh, with your cast of characters. Um, this question, I'd, I'd like to address to, to, to you, Bob. Um, you may probably don't remember this, but back in early 2015, we did an interview during consideration of the Clean Power Plan, and at the time, you expressed um, some concern about you what you characterize as complicated relationships among regulators, the government, utilities, customers, um, and you said the two chief concerns then uh, because of this sort of top-down direction from uh, the Obama administration had to do with glide path and interim targets. Now, uh, this latest move to decarbonization is much more of a bottom-up uh, approach, I think, led by many utilities, including yours. And I guess my question is, uh, is there more pressure now on companies like yours and, and, and your fellow members of the utility sector because of this, because you're creating your own glide path and your own interim targets, is there a risk that uh, you will disappoint? Great. Uh, that, that is always a risk. And actually, I appreciate you going back to the early history. Just a, a quick interjection. Uh, when the Clean Power Plan was stayed, uh, and uh, before that, you know, various pieces of legislation that did not pass, uh, Waxman Markey, there's a real concern that. Uh, targets wouldn't be achieved. And in fact, the industry, uh, regardless of form of ownership of cooperative or IOU, exceeded those targets. So do not underestimate what uh, the industry will do uh, based on uh, economics, technology, customer preference, but with government support. What I would say a real concern right now is, is to uh, align as much as possible uh, the regulation with the goals. So uh, Jim's comments about how his members are customer owned and have that perspective, I would say that a regulatory model uh, like that, if we could bring some elements of that over into the in investor owned side would be incredibly helpful. So my guess is Jim, uh, most of your members have an infrastructure charge have a multi-part uh, energy charge and increasingly have a demand charge on top of that. Whereas on the investor owned side, we are paying uh, for fixed cost infrastructure, which is essential, primarily through volumetric rates. So a challenge, a good follow on to uh, the great work uh, that uh, Jigger and his team are doing would be to you know, look top to bottom at regulation, ask what are the absolute uh, core goals, uh, safety, reliability, resilience, flexibility, uh, decarbonization path. Spell those out uh, as simply as possible, measurably, 
uh, then look at the, the regulatory mechanisms in place and ask, do they advance uh, those goals or do they perhaps uh, hold you back? And that can be pricing, it can be various kinds of cross subsidies built into the system and also look at the process. Does the process enable you to take advantage partnering with your customers of the opportunities that are out there? So the, uh, uh, the rural cooperative movement, very flexible, able to work directly with the customers, uh, much more challenging on the investor owned utility side. So if we could collectively agree to, to do that kind of very difficult work, uh, that would be just a huge step forward and would allow all of us to better take advantage of the opportunities, uh, better partner with our customers and better achieve uh, federal and state policy goals. Thank you. Robert Walton of Utility Dive. Thanks, Llewellyn. Thanks for having me on. Um, Jigar, we've seen a lot of funding opportunities out of DOE recently. It seems like things are moving pretty quickly. Um, I guess sort of two questions, given the pace of the energy transition, uh, should DOE sort of know sooner than it has in the past whether or not these uh, its investments are, are working and what's the timeline for sort of, um, you know, having an idea if, if these are paying off for taxpayers um, and in particular on hydrogen, what's the potential there? Uh, what's the, what's the end goal for, for the department? Yeah, it's a great set of questions and I'll, I'll clearly answer for myself. I don't know that I speak for the entire Department of Energy. Um, but what I would say is that in general, the goal here is trillion dollar liftoff of sectors, right? And so the goal here is not for each individual project to have some sort of success story. Clearly they will or won't and they'll demonstrate technology and, they, and, and they'll do those things. But liftoff is a very curious thing, right? When you think about, um, we had $160 billion of interest in nuclear power in 2008 and 2009. I mean, that has largely gone away and a lot of folks are scared today of like going to their public service commission with a nuclear application to rate base a nuclear plant. The same thing's true for geothermal. We had four big geothermal projects that were built in that 2010, 2011 timeframe, clearly did not achieve liftoff during that time period. But when you think about the $5 billion of, of money that we put into utility scale solar and then another five in utility scale wind, and then the $465 million we put into Tesla, and then the money we put into the gigafactory for Nissan, Clearly, we did reach liftoff in those four sectors, right? And trillions of dollars have followed on from relatively small investments that we made out of the loan programs office, right? And so the question becomes, when you look at the International Energy Agency and all of the other analyses that have been done, there's 20 plus sectors that have to cross the bridge to bankability and reach full market acceptance for us to have a chance of meeting the 2035 goals the president has set down or the 2050 goals that he set down for decarbonization. And right now, those 20 technologies have not crossed the bridge to bankability. So, so when you look at private sector interest, hydrogen is a great example. We have over $33 billion of projects that have been either you know, like announced publicly in press releases or announced to me in my inbox um, around people who you know, want to do uh, solar, uh, solar to hydrogen or blue hydrogen or you know, different colors and all those other things. And it's amazing, right? It really is amazing to see that level of interest. And it does take roughly $100 billion of investments to get through that bridge to bankability to full market acceptance. And so we're well on our way on hydrogen across a limited number of business models and business cases, right? The other long tail of business cases hasn't yet like found its footing. Um, but I do think that we're, we're on our way there in a way that we weren't in the, you know, sort of... Um, the you know hydrogen uh, hype cycle in the early 2000s or, or some of the other areas. And so, so I think it's important to recognize that DOE provides this de-risking function to these technologies, but only to attract private sector capital, right? That's the whole point, right? The private sector is the one who runs this stuff and we enable it. And so if we achieve liftoff, we've succeeded. If we don't, then we haven't. Um, Jennifer Hiller. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity to ask some questions. I also have a question for Jigger about just what kind of technologies you're seeing come to you first um, in terms of either 
I don't know if you're getting actual applications at this point or or just inquiries. Um, and I'm just curious if it's, you know, is it carbon capture? Is it coal to nuclear? And I guess like part two of that question would be on the coal to nuclear front. I think you in your intro said that 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 you consider that lower risk. And I'm just kind of curious, you know, why that would be lower risk versus other technologies. Well, I mean, we certainly should ask some of the other panelists, um, you know, on their perception of risk, I'd say, because they're the ones who apply to the loan programs office for loans. But I would say that we have to differentiate between technology and execution, right? So when I say lower risk, I mean the technology. It is very clear that the GE Itachi technology, the new scale technology, the whole tech technology, which is Gen 3 plus nuclear technology work. Everyone knows they work. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has already approved a new scale. That's different from saying we have the supply chain of EPC contractors and workforce to build the project on budget and on time frame, right? And so that's a different risk than the underlying technology, right? And so, so I just think we want to differentiate those two things, right? And I think in terms of applications, yeah, we've received 84 applications that we're actively uh, reviewing. We receive roughly nine more a month. And um, you know they're seeking $86.5 billion of loan proceeds. Um, we've got 14 billion of those are in nuclear, um, but we also have uh, a lot in carbon sequestration and storage, probably over $6 billion there, as well as battery recycling, as well as you know critical minerals and, and other areas. And so, I mean, I think there's a tremendous amount of interest and people have clearly spent hundreds of hours to put those applications in. So they've had to spend their time and effort to do that. Um, but yeah, look, this is a more of an art than a science, right? Like I can explain to you exactly how a project might work and, you know, technology, feedstock, offtake, right? Who's going to operate it? But, you know, a lot of these executives have to feel that they have the permission to pursue these projects, right? From their stakeholders, from their shareholders, from, from others. And if they don't feel like they have the, uh, the ability to propose these solutions, well, then they're going to be slow to do that. Thank you. Matt Chester, Energy Central. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to address this question maybe to the several utility leaders we have, and uh, maybe I'll start with David. You know, everything we're talking about today really represents some of the you know most important and, and largest change the utilities are going through. But I'm curious if you can speak to how you see those changes going, how they're going to impact the customers, and, and is that a top area of focus that you look at as you evaluate you know the future? You know, what's the change in relationship you might see coming down the line with customers as you adjust to meet these challenges? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, as a co-op, as, as Jim mentioned, I mean, we're owned by our members. And so our members drive a lot of what we, uh, what we do. And that rate impact is a significant piece of how we evaluate what makes sense um, and, and how we, how we spread that out. So, you know, as we're looking through these programs, we're looking at programs and, you know, trying to balance how can we handle this at the wholesale level? Are there some other options that we're able to utilize some of these uh, as we look to the transition? You know, it's it's more than just the commodity itself. Uh, can we can we take into account some of the ancillary services to take into account some of the resiliency and, and all that gets rolled in together? And then it becomes what's that value proposition for? for that uh, member, that consumer at the end of the line, because that's ultimately is what drives it. And we have to be able to show that we're providing value to those folks. Ken Silverstein, Folds. Thank you very much for having me and hello everyone. Uh, my question is on electrification of the economy. Uh, and it's a, um, um, a two-pronged question. The first part, is in order to reach the decarbonization goals, um, most of the underlying fuels need to come from uh, carbon-free fuels, uh, renewables. Um, but does that preclude, um, you know, coal or natural gas from playing a role in a modern economy? And then the second part of the question is I just did a story on Air Canada and it's bought a fleet of electric jets. Um, 
and that may be a part and parcel question, but it also interests me as to whether electrification is going to extend beyond the uh, um, cars and to airplanes. I'd like to jump in on that, particularly the first question. Look, electrification is happening in various forms. So we're going to be needing generating more electricity, not less, as we go forward. It's clearly happening in the transportation sector. And I'll come back to that, what I said in my opening comment. We're concerned about reliability, and you need to have always available dispatchable resources to maintain the grid. It can't be 100% intermediate resources and, and work. So we've been pretty firm at, as a national association that this notion of the electric sector hitting zero uh, net carbon emissions by 2035, it can't happen without severely compromising the reliability of the electric grid. Uh, we think that you have to have some form of always available power, could be nuclear, could be coal, could be natural gas, but in a situation where we need more electricity, uh, the question is how much the portfolio can be in an intermediate resource. A transition, if it's going to happen over the longer run, you're going to need a lot more time, I think, than people are thinking. You're going to need technology to develop a lot more from where it is today. And by the way, just to throw another issue on this, you're going to need more transmission infrastructure than we've got in this country right now. And siding a transmission line is really difficult in this country these days. So there's a lot of considerations that we think need to be put on the table with reliability being the foundational, one of the foundational concerns. Uh, if you end up with the lights going out all the time, consumers are going to react in a very negative way and you're going to lose any momentum. So reliability, I think, needs to be considered. If I could jump in on, on both parts, I'm actually just back from a, a relatively small meeting of CEOs from Asia, uh, North America, and Europe. The meeting happened to be in Oslo. Uh, so first of all, there was a, a, a whole bunch of reality introduced over the last year by the situation in Ukraine and the need for diverse supply and security of supply. And then second, just as we were adjourning uh, the uh, announcement about the pipeline sabotage. So consistent with, with Jim's point, yes, we do need a diverse set of resources. You're gonna be using those resources potentially very, very differently, but at times of peak and when market prices are especially high, it's really good to have something uh, that you can turn on uh, and that then you can operate for a long time. Uh, there are obviously uh, technologies to uh, to offset or control uh, emissions. There's a lot of work the gas sector is doing in the entire vertical uh, to deal with methane and to be as clean and responsible as they can be. And there's a really big role for new technologies. So how do you get at the technologies? Well. Um, uh, good organizations like uh, EPRI and the counterpart on the gas side, uh, good work within some of the trade groups, uh, EEI and AGA, uh, work by companies on their own. And then also uh, lots of, uh, probably the majority at this point of investor owns have uh, participated now in one or another uh, venture fund. What's interesting about the one we've participated in, uh, to, your, to your question, is it actually includes uh, the uh, vehicle sector, companies that are working on electrification of facilities uh, and airlines. And airlines are certainly, pun intended, the biggest lift, uh, but there is work being done there. And the challenge is to uh, follow that work, support it, uh, nurture it along. And then to Jigger's point, uh, understand that there is the, there's the technology risk that you can identify, and Jigger and his team are very sophisticated about that. But then uh, understanding a kind of the ecosystem. Do you have the workers? Do you have the supply chain? Ultimately, can you permit whatever the facility happens to be? Parenthetically, permitting is a global discussion. It's not just an American or even a North American um, question. So getting all of those pieces together, like every transition, it's messy, it's complicated takes longer than you might have thought at the start. But when you look back, uh, you may have accomplished more than you actually did. But uh, the lesson uh, everywhere that has adopted, and it seems like much of the world is focusing on a, a net zero by 2050 target, reliability and affordability are the gotta haves. And we cannot do anything that, uh, that jeopardizes that. Can I, Llewellyn, just make one small point here? Um, 
the advanced technology vehicle manufacturing program was was widened and broadened to be able to do electric aircraft in the bipartisan infrastructure law yep. and we have four active applications that have come in to you know to to seek that funding so we'll see how well they do i mean we haven't fully evaluated the applications yet but there's a lot of interest in electric aircraft thank Absolutely. you uh, matt lind can i ask you how <clears throat> do you advise your clients about the future? Are you looking forward to building more gas, more solar, uh, or more transmission, or all of them? Or And do you think we can double the output of electricity as the demand curve seems to suggest by 2050? Yes, thank you, Llewellyn. I was looking to jump in there's a lot of been a lot of good discussion here um, and certainly I think when we look at the challenges um, and reliability being a, a key focal point um, and trying to balance that with affordability um, you know reliability many of the panelists have mentioned this that dispatchable resources is important and is really key to uh, maintaining reliability and so as we think about affordability as we make this journey i think the more we can leverage existing infrastructure that's going to allow us to actually get there um, but we're going to undoubtedly we're going to need more of a lot of things so i think the ability to have a diversity of technologies is going to allow us to get there more affordably but those technologies that do offer some dispatchability are going to allow the reliability piece to remain um, in place so when we, as we look at the future getting to 2050 we can't simply rely on solar wind and storage we're going to need other options so having the diversity of technologies um, you know hydrogen maybe uh, leveraging some of the existing infrastructure or retrofitting some of that infrastructure from a delivery standpoint. These are all things that will allow us to avoid the long lead times that come with developing, building new transmission, building new generation. Um, the more we can leverage the existing assets, the more affordable and the quicker we'll be able to get there. Thank you. Uh, Rod Cochrell. Well, thank you, Llewellyn. Um, I'd like to follow up on Ken's uh theme of electrification and, and how, how we actually get there by 2050, if that's all possible. Um, in the past two years, more than 20 states have passed legislation or considered legislation uh, that would preempt the city's ability to uh, require all new buildings to be electrified. Uh, these bills tend to be supported broadly by the fossil fuel industry and their allies. And I'm wondering that as, as we get closer uh, to 2030, 40, 2045, 2050, how much will that sort of competition for customers and for revenue between the electric utility sector and the oil and gas industry uh, maybe slow down uh, the move to decarbonization because uh, that competition is becoming more and more fierce. I mean, every time someone buys an electric car, they're, they're taking money out of the pockets of, uh, of the refining sector. So as we move towards electrification and, and it's the noble goal it is, uh, how much is there going to be sort of more open uh, competition uh, between both the electric sector and the oil and gas sector. And that's anybody who cares to weigh in on that. I mean, I can I can start by saying that um, I don't view it that way. Okay. Um, I, I do think from a consumer standpoint, you want competition, right? Whether it's ethanol or oil and gas or electricity or whatever it is. I mean, people should have choice. And I think in the past, we haven't done a great job of providing them that choice. So it's good to provide it to them now. But I think when you look at our refining sector, we have eight refineries that are slated to close over the next two years. Um, the oil and gas industry are, is finding it extraordinarily difficult to maintain 100 million barrels a day globally. And so I think they actually feel a lot of relief that electric vehicles are coming on the scene and actually like relieving them from some of the pressure of having to go into some of the hardest to drill places to find new oil production, right? You have decline rates every single year and, you know, getting affordable oil from, uh, you know, the oil sands in, Cal in Canada or Arctic oil or things is, is really problematic, right? So I don't, I don't think you're seeing as much pushback from the oil and gas sector as you would think. And there's a lot of old infrastructure that they're actually taking out of service. What I would add to that, I mentioned that we are an electric company uh, but we also have extensive natural gas infrastructure, transmission uh, distribution, and uh, a small amount of supply. Uh, so just, just from that perspective, first of all, we're, we are working with others on the electric infrastructure to support whether it's fleet electrification, uh, 
personal vehicles uh, processes. There's a lot of good in there, uh, but I think the, uh, the the key is cost-effective electrification. And in our part of the world, uh, natural gas is an incredibly important fuel for end uses uh, in the home and in in various processes. Uh, it it is simply an efficient way to heat. But you want it. You want your natural gas system to be as efficient and as clean as possible, whether that's dealing with uh, methane emissions or the efficiency of uh, end use appliances or uh, good old fashioned natural gas energy efficiency programs. One of the challenges though, again, back to my comment about regulated pricing is in a world where you're trying to encourage the most efficient use you possibly can, uh, does it make sense to pay for that infrastructure volumetrically? I mean, it's a little bit like uh, you've got one foot on the uh, brake uh, efficiency, one foot on the accelerator volumetric pricing, and you need uh, a, a one pedal operation uh, where you try to harmonize all that. And again, the co-ops are further along there, but I certainly see uh, an important long-term role for natural gas. Meanwhile, a lot of the, uh, the larger uh, oil companies are developing their own transition strategies as you look uh, at how they continue to invest in, in their traditional resources, which as we see in Europe are incredibly important, uh, but are also in investing in, uh, in where they see their future to be. Jennifer. Good answer. Thanks so much. Um, I have a question about demand response and I'm not sure who wants to pick this one up, but I'm kind of curious about uh, given the role I guess what's the future role of demand response or you know time of use rates and things like that given that we are seeing reliability challenges in many parts of the country already so i'll jump in on on that uh, jennifer uh we we've got several of those programs already in place and we've already structured uh, even at the wholesale level to try to provide those price signals to our members directly and to, to, to so that way there's a, a clean view uh, that they can see and to the extent that they have programs like a thermostat program or uh, uh, water, heat, water heater control or a, even a standby generator that, that those signals and those uh, mechanisms are in place that they can adapt and to the extent that that we're able to save money uh, at the wholesale level, they see those savings on, on, on their level and trying to make sure uh, that's, that's the way we've kind of handled it is trying to be as transparent on the price signals as we can. And, uh, and, and even taking those and looking and, and trying to minimize the confusion at the, at the consumer standpoint. But uh, again, it's, there's multiple products that we're able to focus on and where it represents cost savings to the member and increases the reliability and resiliency of the system. From a, a retail perspective, I, I'd say a couple of things. First, there are all kinds of flavors of programs different uh, companies are doing. One of the things EEI has done very well is uh, bring together the uh, electric retail provider and technology companies to develop different kinds of strategies. Uh, demand response, uh, time of use are, are necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, lots of lessons from California, for example. I recently participated in a, a good discussion with uh, Edison in, in that case. Uh, a 10 year journey at the California Commission to go from uh, the first conversations in 2012 to something that is now post pilot in 2022. Uh, and I think they would tell you was an important resource uh, going through the recent sustained demand peak, but uh, the size of the resource, the ability to access that resource is going to uh, vary pretty tremendously from area to area, depending on the on the nature of the demand uh, peaks. My part of the world, we have uh, sustained demand both summer and winter. In the winter, that is uh, typically multi-day, bitterly, bitterly cold. And so it's not a not a convenience uh, issue, but a life and safety issue. And the same is true in warm uh, areas in the summer. Though I was just going to add, uh, sorry, we we saw with California, you know, a near miss. Instead of a you know rolling blackouts, um, demand response was a, a big important part of the toolbox there to avoid that. So I think clearly, demand response has a, a place in the future. 
Um, and but I, I do think there is going to be a challenge as we can electrify more things, electric vehicles. Only um, the ability to drive electric vehicles in California now, New York, um, and where's next? Uh, you know, the ability to curtail that demand on the electric side may be challenging as we further electrify other sectors of the economy. But um, diversity of technologies, demand response being one of those technologies. Um, will allow for reliability and, and hopefully affordability as, as we make this transition. I find it amazing how hard it is for people to wrap their mind around this issue. I think it just gets so big. Um, just to give you some perspective, the total amount of utility scale batteries that are expected to be on the grid by 2030 is 150 gigawatt hours, the total. The total amount of cars that we will ship in 2030 alone with the batteries in their car is 850 gigawatt hours. That doesn't even include buses and heavy trucks and all the other things that you have, right? Like to suggest that this is something other than a mainstream grid operations exercise is ridiculous, right? This will literally become the next way that you manage the grid, right? Even if you decide not to pull any power out of the batteries, right? That's V to G. Even if you just do manage charging and you say, you know, hey, we'll give you a cheaper electricity rate if you let us manage when your car gets charged. Remember, most people only refuel their car once a week or once every two weeks, right? The, many folks can recharge their car every day in their garage, right? And so Florida Power and Light has a new tariff where they say, look, for $38 a month, we'll pay for the bi-directional charger and give you a cheaper rate. And, and you actually, actually it's not cheaper rate, it's unlimited charging. It's unlimited kilowatt hours, right? As long as they could get to control when it goes into your into your tank. Um, like, I just think that, that people are using the model of last year to predict the model of 2030, and they're just getting it woefully wrong. You know, the idea of, you know, follow the money. Um, there are so many interesting technologies that potentially, and this jigger is to your uh, first point, that uh, you, you, it's hard to know what's going to happen from idea to implementation. Uh, but the number of technologies that can potentially make so many things happen in the background uh, really, really is exciting. And what technologies win? Uh, but as I've said probably too many times before, it really does depend in significant part on getting policies that are equitable and sustainable and efficient uh, at the retail level. We are getting some questions on the Q&A function. One comes from Terence Hill, who wants to know about the impact of microgrids and what is their future for the whole panel. Anybody want to jump in? Maybe we'll start with Jim. I'm not sure I have the most uh, fulsome answer in this. I think I think it's an important uh, tool in the toolbox, and I know a lot of our members in the electric cooperative sector are very interested in uh, what flexibility and uh, opportunity microgrids create. We've already got a group of co-ops in Alaska that have been doing this for a long time in our membership, but other members in the lower 48 are now very interested. We do view this as an opportunity to, uh, as I said, enhance flexibility and and build on reliability. So it's an important tool. Anybody some, else? Yeah, some things we're doing. We do have um, microgrid applications in places like Yellowstone Park. Uh, the, the thing I've been interested in for a number of years is our uh, long-term asset planners have developed uh, some pilots to address rural reliability on radial lines. And if you think about our, our service territory, long, long radials up over the mountains or uh, out across the plains, uh, so what we're interested in, we've identified actually a long list of potential sites, is um, storage plus controls uh, at remote locations to improve rural reliability, but also to at least uh, defer substation work. One of the challenges, uh, well, two, one, simply getting uh, the batteries. So we, we, we do need to address that supply chain issue. And second, even in some rural locations, uh, getting uh, getting control of the sites to uh, to to do the installation, but um, it, it's an exciting opportunity to uh, to really improve service to our rural customers. Ken Silverstein. Yes, I, I'd like to um, expand upon an earlier point, which is that 
in order to fulfill these um, goals, elect, particularly increasing the electrification of the economy, it's going to need more transition uh, transmission lines, or it's and it's going to need better transmission technology. So it's sort of another two-part question, which is um, permitting is a very, very difficult thing, whether it be transmission lines, natural gas lines. Um, what is the prospect um, that, that, that that's going to change in order to meet these goals? And then secondly, what technologies are out there that might allow more electrons to be transmitted uh, to avoid having to go through this permitting process? So I'll, I'll give you some, some of our uh, experience, Ken, and, and of course, serving some of the outskirts of the Dallas Metroplex. Uh, transmission is a challenge for us. Uh, even in the last three years, one of the things that we've done just, uh, it's, it's very low tech, but just upgrading the conductor sizes and going from uh, looking at, you know, the trapezoidal uh, as opposed to just, you know, it's, it's what's, what's the, what's the conductor itself, just to be able to utilize existing right away, uh, but get more throughput. You know, one of the challenges that we have in uh, the permitting process is, you know, at least here, our process, it's, it's at least a two-year process just to get the, the project uh, permitted, approved through the regulatory process, and, and, and into the construction. I mean, that's not even construction. So, you know, we're trying to... It, I mean, you're, you're, you kind of have to work with the hand that you're dealt from a regulatory standpoint. But, uh, you know, those are some of the things that we're trying to do is look at uh, even more so down the road as to how can we uh, acquire the right of way that we need? How can we work with and perhaps even, you know, in the past, you know, where we would have our own right of way, maybe we can join up with others in those uh, in that space to 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 minimize the, the land impact that we have. But, uh, you know, that's the, the, the timing is a, is, is a challenge as we look to see what kind of projects can we justify and what are we able to build? I, I would I would add here. Uh, so I don't know that I'm uh, more bullish on the time or the ability to permit new right away new lines. I think that's going to always be a challenge, continue to be a challenge. Um, I think even on top of that, just the planning process, if we look at this on a broader regional perspective, um, looking at new transmission transfer capability, and I think there's um, discussions and focus on trying to improve this, but that ability to see the future and then plan for that and, and get those lines built um, is going to also be something that takes some time and will lag um, for where we need to go in the future. Um, then from an affordability standpoint or just the ability to get more, I think, get more out of what is out there today, the existing infrastructure. So looking at um, ratings, line ratings, dynamic line ratings, um, changing those based on ambient air condition or air conditions, um, things like the being, being able to push and pull power through different pathways at different times based on what's being produced at that hour during the day, at night, et cetera. Those are all opportunities to get more um, in addition to what David was saying in terms of bigger conductors, um, get more with what we've already got um, is, is at least an early uh, part of the solution, I'd say. Thank you. Matt Chester. Thanks. So as we've touched upon the, the electrification of transportation, it's taking a lot of the attention and headlines and, and rightfully the excitement and, and it opens up tools like V2G, smart charging, things we've talked about. But I'm curious how our panelists see the, the increased load in the coming years from, from heating and cooling and especially as heating continues to get more electrified. Is this an area that's getting enough focus and, and will the heating and cooling area have as many opportunities as transportation? You know, we talked about demand response and pricing signals, but is there anything else to key into both in terms of utility programs or maybe emerging technologies? Anybody want to grab that? Yeah, I offered my opinion on the, the role of natural gas for end use applications. Uh, I think there is a long-term uh, role there. On the other hand, there are certainly great applications, great opportunities 
uh, in electrification of various processes, facilities, warehouses. Uh, Prologis, a very large warehouse um, provider, is uh, has launched an, a, an EV support program in their facilities. Um, uh, uh, Oshkosh uh, is very aggressively uh, working with post office to electrify those vehicles. So there are lots of opportunities uh, for for growth beyond simply personal EVs, as exciting as those all, all are. The challenge is in each case, you, you really need an ecosystem, uh, multi, multiple aspects to it to, uh, to support what, what's happening. A and lot of that can... actually sells itself because it's, uh, it's not, not just clean, but quiet, uh, typically uh, lower maintenance, and oh, by the way, uh, fun to drive. I can add a little bit on the heating and cooling side. I'd say that I think that in general, um, perspective is hard to come by these days. And I feel like, you know, when you think about heat pumps, for instance, 35% of all new homes already come with heat pumps. So the notion that like, this is a new technology that's never been done before, et cetera, is like, it's just not, you know, like it's, it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of a weird thing. And look, I mean, the way that, that your refrigerator uses dramatically less energy to provide um, cooling is through heat pumps. That's, that's how we've reduced uh, the, you know, the amount of energy that your refrigerator uses. Heat pump water heaters are now becoming commonplace and people are starting to put those in. And so I think that the notion that this is weird or new or whatever, or, you know, you, you don't replace natural gas in these applications through sacrifice. You replace it through better technology. And people generally like heat pumps a lot better than using natural gas for heating. And so, um, and having two different systems, right? Because when many homes have um, a fossil fuel powered system for heating and then an electric powered system for air conditioning, right? And so now you have the ability to do both in one, right? So I just think that, um, that this is inevitably going to occur, right? It's just better technology. Everyone wants better technology. Now we've got to train HVAC contractors. We have to train the supply chain. We have to do all the hard work to make sure that you know the transition occurs um, and consumer preferences are honored, right? Today, when things break, a lot of HVAC technicians say, sorry, I don't have that in inventory. It'll be two months if you want that efficient one, but I have an inefficient one in my back you know, my pickup truck I can install today. We just have to change that. We have to make sure that like, you know, that inventory is available and customers have real choice. Thank you. Robert Walton. Thanks. Yeah, um, Jim, maybe this is for you. And then I don't know, David and Robert, are there, um, are there challenges that smaller rural utilities will face in the transition that, that larger, maybe investor-owned utilities do not and does that translate into to greater risk for for customers on their bills as they you know utilities sort of have to turn to new technologies to to produce more energy that that's also carbon free yeah well it, it's a great question as as you know we serve the the hardest and most expensive places to serve in america just based on uh the population density or lack of density quite frankly these are hard places to serve and uh, I think that the, the issue that we have that in terms of reliability that I've been talking about so long on this, on this program is one where we want to make sure we're making decisions where our consumers have the ability to take advantage of these opportunities. You know, I will say this, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Bill have both provided significant opportunities for electric cooperatives to access funds to make real investments in their systems. It's an exciting opportunity. And I think you made the point at the start about the direct pay uh, provisions that are in the Inflation Reduction Act that allow electric cooperatives and municipal utilities, I might as well, who are tax exempt, to have access to the economic opportunities of tax incentives for investment in different energy technologies. So to me, um, th these pieces of legislation have helped level the playing field and given cooperatives more opportunity um, so I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to cry poor and tell you, oh, we have a much more difficult circumstance the investor owns. But I do think our scale is different. Um, it's smaller. Um, capital investments uh, represent a more significant portion of our balance sheets because our balance sheets are smaller, and that does put us in a different position where we've just got to be really careful about how we manage our investments 
in uh, in whatever transition is going to take place. Thank you, um, Rod Kukro. Oh, thank you, Llewellyn. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering what strategies the uh, electricity industry may may be contemplating to surmount um, sort of the, this movement of political opposition to electrification, to decarbonization, uh, for the simple reason that uh, opponents of those things tend to tie it to uh, belief in climate change. And it breaks down in many cases to a red and blue state issue. And of course, in the, from 2016, 2020, the federal government really checked out entirely of uh, anything having to do with clean power and making a transition to, to decarbonization. So uh, you were seeing more of this at the state level, as I mentioned earlier, we could see it again at the federal level uh, in the next several presidential election cycles. What's the strategy of the industry to try to keep the momentum going uh, despite this sort of growing movement of opposition to clean power. So Rod, going back to the, my, my first comment to you during the, the period you mentioned, uh, what was industry doing uh, and focused on, again, technology, economics, uh, the trend line was still very positive. Uh, our states are uh, appropriately very conservative when it comes to ensuring reliability and affordability, and we agree. Uh, so when we laid out our uh, net zero target, uh, we, we made quite clear that in the first instance, those were our priorities. We're going to be making investments uh, that are aligned with those priorities. We believe that uh, consistent with the evolution of technology and uh, modifications in practice, uh, Jigger mentioned ground source heat pumps, for example. Heat pumps are a, an evolving technology. There are a lot of things that we can do that make sense from a customer perspective that move us, uh, move us forward. I'm very uninterested, deeply uninterested uh, in the kind of polarizing discussions where everybody uh, takes their ideological uh, position. On the other hand, uh, everyone is, is, is truly concerned about you know, the various uh, you know, severe weather events, truly concerned about resilience. Resilience has uh, strong economic value. Uh, and if, if you focus in areas like that, I think you can, you can move forward. But I, I wish we could uh, find a, a broad space where we can agree and, and then focus on the most efficient ways to get there. You know, I'm quoting Arthur Oaken, uh, focus on the least leaky buckets. <laughs> <clears throat> Chester. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I know that the, a lot of entities, you know, both government and non-government spend a lot of time and effort in, in modeling and forecasting the future power load that we're, we're talking about a lot today. And obviously there's, there's a lot of uncertainty to that. And sometimes we can look back and see that the forecasts were, were off in hindsight. And you know, obviously it's only in hindsight, but you know, so those forecasts today were, were likely taking with some level of a grain of salt. So I'm curious for, for those on the panel, you know, how much are you paying attention to those long-term forecasts as they're updated and changed? How much are they being integrated specifically into the planning process or processes, or are you seeing them more as kind of broad guidelines, but you're not putting too much emphasis on, on the specifics behind them? Who wants to tackle that? I'm yapping too much. But I can yeah, yeah, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I agree because I, I think you look at uh, the near miss here in California earlier in September, you know, the projections, the forecasts for even just what demand was going to look like was under, you know, predicted relative to what actually came about. Same thing with uh, Yuri. So I, I think the the, the reality is that we've got to look at the future um, planning this, um, you know, transition with the resources, the technologies that are available, um, do it without as much emphasis on how this has looked in the past and say, how do we, how do we look at different resiliency measures? Um, when do we need energy? And it's not just in the summer peaks anymore. It's we've got to evolve that to look at what's happening in the winter. If we've got more demand in the winter, are we, do we have energy resources sufficiently able to provide that? And, you know, the, the solar profile is different in the summer and the winter. Um, all these things need to be factored in as we and 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 are being evolved in the planning process. Um, to, you know, so like the seasonal uh, resource adequacy construct is is just one example of that, where we're not just looking at one peak period of time; we're looking at multiple seasons um, for that. So there's a lot of ways that I think it's evolving, but um, I probably still 
more room to to improve on that. Bob, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, what I would add um, at the kind of the big grid level uh, in South Dakota, we participate in SPP. Uh, they have uh, made a lot of progress, I think, in the last several years based on lessons learned. Um, so really good work there. In the West, it's the non-organized market. We're very active with the Western Power Pool. Their work around uh, resource adequacy assessment, their kind of uh, very sophisticated work around effective load carrying capacity. Again, that's up at the big grid level. At, at the level of our system, uh, we focus on capacity writ large. So our uh, electric and gas transmission departments work with our um, supply units and even with the distribution folks to understand where the stress points are on our grid. And this is in the context of our, in our Montana operation, we're more exposed to the regional market than is any other electric company in the West. But an integrated approach within the company, kind of bringing all uh, eyes to bear on the problem. And uh, what I would say is that even using relatively conservative assumptions about growth, uh, there are some significant uh, uh, capacity uh, challenges on our system. And if, if growth uh, exceeds that, uh, then, uh, then we have to redouble our efforts. But capacity is, a, is not simply a supply concept, uh, but it's how much reserve, how much flex do you need in all aspects of your system? And what's the cost and what's the value of that? Yeah, so, I mean, you like to, oh, sorry, go ahead. One thing I would say is that, look, I think that growth is gonna surprise everybody. This is an industry that has had no growth since 2003, right? So it's not surprising that, you know, the boy who cried wolf, like it doesn't get listened to this time around, right? But when you think about how fast electric vehicles are being adopted by households, and it's not just the number of cars, everybody who buys an electric vehicle in a three car household is shifting over 50% of their miles to that car, right? And so when you think about just how fast this is shifting, it'll surprise you. And you also just have structural moves to heating and cooling going electric, not because of regulation, but just because it's better. It's actually lower electricity bills and heating bills for people, particularly at a time when fuel oil is up, natural gas is up, et cetera, right? So I think that this will scare people and it will shock people how fast this is coming. And that's why we talk a lot about coal to nuclear, all these other things, because we've got to get ahead of it. Like people have been used to being able to just, you know, use their existing infrastructure for longer without really thinking about how to add more infrastructure, but America's got to be able to do big things again. Like I get it, like it's hard, everything's hard, but you know, we have the right people. We have clearly all the technology. And the question becomes, how do we really do big things again here? Just like we did in, you know, hitting a 530 foot asteroid with a satellite this week um, using AI. We know how to do this. It's, it's a human issue around how we move faster, how we move more confidently, and then how we export these solutions to the rest of the world. Thank you, Jigger, and I think you wrapped it up so perfectly. We will not ask any further questions. We're out of time. I would uh, sort of summarize the problem with the old saying, which was uh, has been used by several political figures, but which I believe was originally said by Lloyd George, the British prime minister during the First World War, which is, it is dangerous to leap a chasm in two bounds. <laughs> so we better be careful we're not doing this. It's been a superb panel. I thank everybody very, very much indeed for their time, their intelligence, and their contribution, invaluable. And Sheila, would you like to take us away now? I would add just on my own behalf, my thanks to Dominic Levings, who helped me technically enormously. Sheila? Yes, thank you, Llewellyn, and thank you to our tremendous speakers and our panel uh, of, uh, of very insightful reporters uh, and commentators. We really appreciate your, your gift of your precious time in these uh, calamitous and challenging times. We know how, how difficult and the pressure that you're under, so it means even more to us, and we thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. We look forward to seeing much more of you in the future. Thank you all. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.